Afrique Média. Le monde, c'est nous. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us on this first edition of the program Views on the Continent for the weekend. You're most welcome to the Pan African Television. Africa Media, where we want to examine the uh, complex uh, relationship between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Uh, and of course, our topic for today uh, has Ukraine's uh, pursuit of our Western uh, agenda hindered its ability to seek diplomatic solutions with Russia as far as the Russia-Ukraine crisis is uh, concerned. And today, uh, we are joined uh, by an uh, esteemed uh, personality who will give us uh, insightful perspectives uh, on uh, this important and uh, issue regarding a topic for discussion uh, this day. And of course, uh, it's with uh, uh, great uh, delight that I introduce Mr. Dmitry Polyansky, who is uh, Russia's uh, first deputy uh, permanent representative uh, at the United Nations. He'll be answering uh, a number of questions regarding a topic for discussion uh, this day, and of course, uh, which will help us to dive into uh, a, a thought-provoking uh, moment and gain a deeper understanding uh, of the dynamics at play in uh, this uh, crucial geopolitical relationship patterning the uh, Ukraine-Russia crisis. And of course, we are going to dive straight away uh, to our first uh, question directed to Mr. Dimitri. Of course, the question uh, dates to the genesis of, of the crisis. And of course, the, the uh, armed uh, conflict in Ukraine uh, is rooted in 2014 when uh, the coup d'etat in Kyiv led to the confrontation in the Donbass. Uh, of course, this question uh, directing particularly to you, sir, is uh, what role did uh, the Western uh, countries uh, play in those uh, events? Really, the, the Western countries uh, played a very crucial and very negative role in the Ukrainian tragedy, uh, which epochs we are witnessing today. Uh, exactly 10 years ago, tomorrow, uh, day by day, uh, we will uh, take note of the 10th anniversary of the so-called Maidan, the uh, protests that erupted in uh, Kiev after uh, President at that moment Yanukovych uh, decided not to sign the association agreement between Ukraine and uh, European Union. Uh, saying that he needs uh, a little bit more time to evaluate the consequences for the country after the implementation of this document. It followed uh, several months of uh, very uh, deep deliberations between all sides, European side, Ukrainian side, Russian side, when we tried to explain uh, what will be the consequences of uh, how it will affect uh, bilateral relations and trade between uh, Ukraine and Russia, it was nothing but about trade. Uh, and the, the input, uh, the, the impact would have been uh, devastating. Uh, we were proving this with figures and uh, our Ukrainian colleagues, a lot of our Ukrainian colleagues, uh, including those working with uh, President Yanukovych, were not aware of this. We're not aware of these calculations and modeling of uh, how it will develop. So at some point of time when the information has become uh, overwhelming, they decided to make this U-turn to pause, not to denounce, but to pause the signature of the association agreement. But the problem is that by that time, uh, the West, uh, which has invested a lot of money in the uh, formation of the NGOs and other uh, civil society actors who, who were promoting pro-Western agenda, who were um, trying to introduce uh, in, into the heads of Ukrainian citizens the idea that they should uh, disrupt any ties with Russia and that Ukraine's future in, is within the European Union and NATO and that they will be welcomed there uh, wholeheartedly. Those NGOs were already working and they were not ready uh, to denounce and they were not ready to, to wait. So they decided to, to, to come to action. Uh, and these uh, protests were also preceded by 
uh, several years of very intense uh, nourishing of uh, very radical Ukrainian nationalism. So uh, several years before that, um, during the presidency of uh, predecessor of Mr. Yanukovych, Mr. Yushchenko, uh, Bandera, uh, one of uh, Hitler's uh, collaborators, uh, was announced to be a hero of Ukraine. And a lot of uh, ideology which were which has never been present in Ukraine was uh, introduced from the western part of this country, from those who, who came back from immigration, from those who were children and grandchildren Hello? of of children and grandchildren of those who were uh, fighting alongside with with fascists against against the Red Army, who were committing the crimes of Holocaust and prosecution of uh, many. Uh, hundreds of thousands of, of Jews, of Russians, of Ukrainians, uh, of other nationalities, of Poles. So uh, at the at this moment, uh, exactly 10 years ago, the protests erupted and then uh, it came to the apex uh, in February of the next year uh, when uh, the uh, attempts of, of President Yanukovych to make a deal with, uh, with the opposition uh, the uh, the attempts that were uh, crowned by a draft agreement uh, which was guaranteed by several European countries when it was uh, absolutely uh, denounced by the opposition the next day when it was signed and instead of pursuing the road to national dialogue uh, they uh, ousted uh, President uh, Yanukovych did it in a very unconstitutional manner with the direct involvement of uh, actors from from the West, uh, some of them very prominent figures, like Victoria Nuland, who was coming repeatedly during the Maidan protests, uh, which at some point uh, became very very violent, and there were uh, several dozens of people killed uh, in a very mysterious circumstances, uh, and there has never been a proper investigation, and a lot of people. Uh, basing their position on the on the documents, uh, believe that this was a clear cut provocation uh, from the opposition, uh, and then the the events started to develop in an uncontrollable manner, and um, uh, there was a lot of violence. Uh, some people in Ukraine, in eastern and southern Ukraine, didn't accept uh, the uh, new ideals that were imposed on them. Uh, by the new authorities, they were saying that they don't want to uh, to support them, and there was a lot of violence uh, from the part of of the new Maidan authorities. There was a very uh, heinous massacre in Odessa uh, on the 9th of May, when uh, well, about 50 people uh, were burned alive uh, only because of the fact that they didn't want to submit. Uh, uh, to the uh, to the nationalists, and they were defending their rights as Russian speakers and as those who live in Odessa. Uh, there were violent events in uh, in Mariupol. By that time, the residents of Crimea, uh, looking at the scope of the violence uh, that was uh, engulfing the country, decided to uh, return back to Russia. And also, uh, in the summer of, of the next year, uh, instead of having a dialogue with the eastern regions uh, who said that they don't want to support the Maidan coup, uh, the uh, Ukrainian authorities um, declared a war uh, against the residents of Donbass. And that's how uh, this current, uh, current stage of Ukrainian tragedy has started after the uh, residential areas of, of Donetsk and Lugansk were being shelled, uh, the uh, residents, the local residents uh, took uh, arms and uh, created uh, self militias that were uh, trying to stop the aggression of Ukrainian army against uh, against its own citizens. And this all uh, was uh, lasting for, uh, for nine years, for eight years before the start of the special military operation of uh, Russia in Ukraine. Uh, we uh, tried to find a, a deal uh, to help uh, the Eastern Ukrainians uh, to find a deal uh, with uh, with the uh, Ukrainian government uh, to strike this deal. But actually, the Minsk agreements that were 
uh, signed uh, a year after the eruption of this uh, violence uh, were not implemented by uh, Ukrainian re regime uh, and uh, it was all done with the active involvement uh, and uh, by, by of the west and the west was of course masterminding uh, the uh, all the actions of uh, Ukrainian uh, government of Kyiv regime that's why we believe that the west uh, shares the uh, responsibility uh, and is the primary responsible uh, party for what Ukraine is uh, is witnessing uh, right now Dmitry, uh, quite a complex uh, uh, situation uh, regarding uh, the uh, uh, crisis uh, between or bilateral disagreement between uh, the Russian Federation and uh, Ukraine. We are equally joined uh, by uh, Yulia Burke, a political scientist, uh, to share her own insight uh, on a topic for discussion this day. And it's with pleasure that I welcome you to this uh, program, dear Yulia. The pleasure is definitely mine. Happy to see you again. Hello, Yulia. You're welcome to the program. Yes, um, happy to be here again. Um, happy to be a part of this very important discussion, especially today on the uh, 10th anniversary of the uh, the very beginning of the uh, conflict we're observing right now. Exactly 10 years ago, the uh, Maidan started in uh, Kiev. It's always a pleasure having you to share your own uh, opinion regarding the developments uh, surrounding uh, the conflicts between Russia and Ukraine. And of course, today uh, we are looking at uh, if uh, Ukraine's uh, quest for Western agenda has hindered its uh, diplomatic uh, uh, solution uh, with uh, the Russian uh, Federation. And today uh, we are looking at 10 years into a crisis. So uh, holistically, what can you see uh, regarding uh, Ukraine's uh, stance rega uh, uh, as per the crisis with Russia is concerned, uh, its Western agenda, do you think it has uh, helped or marred the uh, uh, country? Well, um, uh, given the topic of today's discussion, I think one of the key points here would be to define that very Western agenda. Absolutely. Because as it, um, uh, you know, as it's being, you know, widely discussed in the media in different kinds of terms, I think uh, it's important to talk about the very definition of the Western agenda. Sure. Because on the one hand, you see a very active promotion of uh, many different things that uh, do resemble a lot the universal values, right? So the Western agenda that is uh, being displayed uh, at all of the uh, at the international arena, at all of the uh, various venues and international institutions, is all about democracy, sustainable development. It's all about environment and this and that and whatsoever. So you can take the uh, sustainable development goals and go through those and see what uh, is being uh, what is being um, promoted as the Western agenda. Yet at the same time, it's important to keep it real over here and look at the actions of the West. And when you look at the actions of the West or the way those policies are being uh, implemented, you see that it's the very exact opposite. So what we see happening in uh, the European Union, in the uh, United States, it's, uh, you know, relocation of production um, with all of the related environmental consequences relocation of production to the countries of Africa, the countries of Asia especially, and uh, different other ones. So at the same time, you see a complete uh, chaos in terms of uh, values, in terms of moral standards and so on. You see this uh, pursuit of profit by any means. So this is the reality of the Western agenda. And we can talk a lot uh, about uh, you know, all of the uh, universal values, and we can give all those uh, uh, 
uh, speeches uh, that uh, we have heard a lot in the movies. We have heard them, you know, mentioned by celebrities, mentioned by politicians. But in order to analyze the actual Western agenda, look at the actions and their consequences. Go to Africa, any country, and ask about the consequences of the colonial policies. Go to uh, the Balkans, to Serbia, for instance, and ask about NATO interventions. Go to Afghanistan, go to Iraq, Libya, uh, and many other countries, and you will see what it's actually all about. And it's not an issue of bad implementation, because we see that the Western strategies are super effective uh, for many centuries. We see that it's not an issue of resources, because the West has them in, uh, in quite an unlimited way. They print the money, or they uh, create digital money that they control completely. So it's not about that, but it's about the uh, actual agenda that is uh, mostly about benefiting from the resources that they don't have and making it look uh, nice um, in a beautiful wrap up. And this is exactly the trap that unfortunately Ukraine and not just Ukraine got into following the, uh, you know, shiny wrap uh, that uh, was being offered to them. And uh, what turned out to be on the inside was quite disappointing for many. And the ones who are not disappointed yet, I assume, would get there quite soon after they do the analysis. Absolutely, uh, dear uh, Yulia, we'll be uh, coming subsequently uh, to understanding and to see how Ukraine can change our perspectives at uh, this uh, particular moment. But then let's continue with uh, uh, Dimitri. And of course, here we are focusing on uh, solutions or attempts uh, that have been made so far uh, to solving uh, this uh, crisis. And of course, uh, this question uh, to you, Mr. Dimitri, how do you assess the significance of the Minsk agreement and the attempt uh, made to resolve uh, the conflict uh, uh, peacefully? How do you assess the role of uh, Russia and Western countries, particularly in uh, this process? We repeatedly made uh, efforts uh, to help uh, to resolve this uh, inter-Ukrainian conflict, this civil war that er erupted after the Kyiv regime started uh, military operation against the residents of Donbass. Uh, the best chance to do so was uh, with the implementation of Minsk agreements, uh, the package of measures uh, which was signed in 2015, the second package. and. This uh, package included a lot of concrete steps, which would be quite rational for any other country. Um, and they were implemented by OSCE, as you know, uh, but it turned out to be, as we know perfectly well right now, that these uh, disagreements were nothing but a smokescreen for Ukraine and its, uh, its uh, Western backers uh, to arm Ukraine and to prepare it uh, for a conflict with Russia. And uh, Ukraine was gradually becoming anti-Russia, threatening our country, uh, absolutely despising uh, the rights of Russian-speaking population, which is uh, which still constitutes majority of Ukrainian population, regardless of what you can read in Ukrainian media, but the Russian language is still omnipresent uh, in Ukraine. Some people are, on, are only afraid of using it, but this is their native language. And there is nothing bad uh, uh, elsewhere in the world to promote uh, the rights of minorities, but in Ukraine somehow it, it started to face problems. And uh, our former Western partners, instead of uh, teaching Ukraine how to deal democratically with all these issues, they started to support the Ukrainian regime, uh, assuming that uh, Russian speakers do not have any future in, in Ukraine, that Russian language doesn't have any future, that the version of history that was imposed by Western Ukrainians uh, implying heroization of, uh, of Nazi collaborators, that only this version of history is right and it should be implemented throughout the whole of Ukraine. This all uh, moves uh, didn't uh, contribute to looking for a peaceful solution. Uh, so when we started uh, our special military operation in February 2022, uh, we didn't see any other way out to stop uh, the uh, actions of Kyiv regime against the civilian population of Donbas. 
it was preceded by intensification of shelling of Donetsk and Lugansk when hundreds of thousands of refugees started to come to Russian uh, territory. And uh, it also was preceded by diplomatic moves by my country to uh, pr to, pr to propose uh, treaties on European security uh, to, to NATO and the United States, which were rejected, uh, condescendingly re rejected. So we made several efforts to do so. Then we understood that uh, we are on the eve of a very massive, uh, mass scale provocation uh, from Ukrainian regime, which might imply uh, a massive military operation against Donbas. And uh, then we decided uh, to start our special military operation. Um, mm -hmm. And during the pace of our special military operation, the first phase of our operation was very quick. And you, as you remember, our, uh, our military uh, were near capital Kiev and uh, in some other places. So um, in, in a month, and during this time, there were several efforts to uh, to, con to come to certain negotiated solution. The most important of them uh, almost succeeded uh, in uh, at the beginning of April, end of March 2022, when there were talks first in Minsk, then in uh, Istanbul, Istanbul, and uh, when draft treaty was uh, initialed by Ukrainian delegation. Uh, this draft treaty uh, had very, a lot of uh, a lot of things that uh, Ukraine uh, is uh, maybe dreaming about right now, but the time has been lost after that. And uh, of course, uh, the condition for moving forward was uh, Ukraine becoming a uh, neutral state and uh, rights for Russian language and uh, good neighborhood uh, with Russia. Uh, all these things were in this document and initially as i said ukraine accepted this document but when it was announced uh, all of a sudden uh, ukraine uh, became a target of uh, a lot of pressure from mostly uh, the uk and the us uh, and uh, all these people uh, first and foremost uh, boris johnson former um, british prime minister who visited kiev tried to uh, discourage uh, Zelensky to sign this document and try to convince him that Ukraine will be capable of uh, winning against Russia uh, and that the terms of this agreement uh, are not good for Ukraine. And he and, he and other uh, Western politicians uh, succeeded in uh, convincing Zelensky that Ukraine could win and Zelensky rejected this treaty and instead of this started uh, to uh, invest in a very uh, large-scale military uh, campaign against Russia. So he, he made a bet on winning militarily against Russia, which was a b big and fatal mistake, as we all understand right now, and I think that even himself understands right now. So the role of the West was also uh, uh, key here, and the West was not interested uh, of um, of Ukraine and Russia living in peace because that was not the reason why the West has triggered this uh, crisis uh, uh, from the outset. So the ta the task was to to weaken Russia. Of course, they understand that it's it's impossible to uh, inflict a, a defeat on Russia, but maybe they also counted that the Russian society will be. Uh, mobilized against President Putin, that there will be internal unrest, and uh, maybe they would be successful in uh, in a regime change in Russia, the things that have, they have done repeatedly all over the world. This was one of the calculations. And the second plan B was just to, uh, to weaken Russia as much as possible to get as many uh, losses of uh, Russian soldiers and Ukrainian soldiers as possible for Russia uh, to be uh, set back at the mo at the position where it couldn't challenge the West, and uh, the sanctions that were introduced also by the United States and its allies uh, were also um, supposed to play a key role in this process, but they all failed, and uh, the sanctions, as you know, uh, are working only uh, to the detriment of those who introduced these sanctions. Uh, also, militarily, we all see the position on the battlefield. 
and uh, the fact that Zelensky rejected uh, this um, chance for peace and since then has only offered uh, so-called peace plans which are, which are not peace plans uh, because they uh, their key element is uh, de facto uh, capitulation of Russia which is absolutely out of question so I think this fact uh, is uh, now uh, analyzed uh, all over the world and a lot of people uh, understand that the best uh, position in which Ukraine could have uh, good peace uh, has now already uh, passed by and uh, we don't know in what shape uh, the Kiev regime will be uh, during the next such attempt but so far there are even no such attempts and uh, still uh, Zelensky regime has no other way but to uh, claim that it is capable of uh, winning over Russia because it needs military uh, assistance and equipment from the West and it uh, it needs uh, support it needs money and this corrupt country uh, couldn't uh, survive otherwise, otherwise, but only with the, uh, with this um, life support, lifeline uh, from the West. So it's a vicious circle, which is very tragic for Ukraine as a country, because uh, hundreds of thousands of, of people have, have already perished, and the Zelensky regime is using them as a cannon fodder uh, for the uh, pursuit of absolutely foreign uh, geopolitical interests which have nothing to do with Ukraine, which have nothing to do with the interests of his people. And I think that more and more people understand understand this, including in Ukraine. Three, uh, in the same light, uh, uh, regarding uh, steps which have been taken uh, to bring resolve to the crisis, you know, at uh, the uh, meetings of the United Nations Security Council and uh, the General Assembly, the situation in uh, Ukraine and uh, numerous violations of international law and uh, human rights issues related to the uh, uncontrolled uh, arms uh, supplies were discussed uh, severally. Uh, which of the humanitarian uh, consequences of the conflict and uh, the, uh, the action of uh, the uh, government in Ukraine, do you consider the most uh, destructive and uh, what was uh, the position uh, of the uh, Western countries in uh, relations to facts presented at uh, the uh, United Nations? Well, the Western countries have a very short memory when it comes to, to their own uh, crimes and actions, so they uh, started to behave and they try to continue the same line even today. They started to behave as if history, there was absolutely no history before the 20, 24th February 2022. They were claiming that Russian aggression, as they put it, was absolutely unprovoked. It had no reason. Uh, it was absolutely a territorial war, though it's absolutely absurd. It's not about territory, of course. Uh, it's, it's, it's about the rights of the population of the east and uh, south of Ukraine. So they tried to bring this narrative uh, uh, into action in the United Nations. And initially, I know that a lot of countries uh, from the global south, they were overwhelmed by these events. And uh, they absolutely had no time to analyze it uh, thoroughly. And uh, the, the Western countries um, succeeded in uh, mobilizing uh, some support for for their moves against Russia for the formula and the one-sided picture that they wanted to promote at the international arena. But very soon, uh, a lot of our sisters and brothers from, from African countries, from other developing countries, started to see the real picture of what's the role of Western countries in this situation. And this role is not very much difficult from that of uh, of uh, colonialist powers uh, uh, several decades ago when they were trying to divide and rule they were they are absolutely trying to introduce discord among uh, among brotherly people uh, in in russia and ukraine they are absolutely not interested in any kind of cooperation between uh, ukraine and russia uh, this scenario is a, a bad scenario for them they don't need peace between russia and ukraine uh, they want to weaken uh, Russia as much as possible. Uh, so these countries started to uh, to flood Ukraine with weapons, uh, with uh, 
other military support like uh, military data and uh, um, the uh, satellite data they are they were absolutely complicit in a lot of strikes that uh, Ukrainian military uh, did against uh, civilian objects uh, with the use of this uh, satellite and intelligence data provided uh, by the West so very soon our colleagues from these countries of the global south understood that the West is a part of this conflict. It's not a direct part, but NATO, uh, US and its allies are uh, actually uh, masterminding and uh, implementing their, their agenda in Ukraine. And that the Zelensky regime is not um, the one that reflects the uh, desires and the priorities of its own people. So we uh, indeed uh, repeatedly uh, draw attention, draw attention of our colleagues in Security Council and in General Assembly to the factor of Western arms deliveries to Ukraine. Uh, these arms deliveries are very significant uh, even at this date, and it's not only a question of arming Ukraine uh, to make it more capable to fight, but it's also a question of um, making profits uh, from the Ukrainian war is the same way as capitalists uh, and uh, colonialists behaved uh, elsewhere in, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. They're making profits. For them, it's a business. Uh, President Biden re uh, openly said recently that it's a good investment uh, that uh, Ukrainians are dying for, for American money and uh, American lives are spared. Uh, and also, the military industrial co uh, companies are gaining enormous profits from Ukrainian war. The West is testing its uh, arms in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, the West is also uh, uh, making a uh, swamp, swamp of equipment swamp, military equipment swamp out of out of uh, Ukraine because it's, uh, it provides it mostly with quite an obsolete uh, equipment from uh, Eastern Europe, and then these countries are uh, being uh, rearmed and receiving uh, newer uh, equipment, newer uh, military appliances. So this process is beneficial for the West, and they don't want to, to put it uh, to an end. And uh, now uh, a lot of our partners in the UN are uh, looking at this situation through the optics that I described, and it's becoming harder and harder for uh, Western countries to mobilize any support for Kiev regime uh, because of what is what is happening and because of uh, all the facts that have uh, come to the ground uh, about the real int intentions of uh, Kiev regime and its Western backers. Uh, and we see more and more support uh, from the developing countries in the UN and in the world uh, in general. We come uh, back to you, dear Yulia. And of course, uh, uh, we want to accentuate on uh, this uh, very remark uh, made by the uh, uh, Dimitri uh, on the, uh, the aspect of the, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, West actually doesn't really keep a memory of its own uh, actions and of course shortcomings. So with the reality, sir, and stakes already in the fall regarding uh, the Western manoeuvre in uh, Ukraine, what do you think uh, the leadership in K can do actually to maybe it's uh, uh, to re-strategize in uh, the quest to bring resolve uh, to the crisis, which actually uh, it also brings uh, this Western uh, maneuver. We think about uh, the uh, Western hegemony that the world is actually trying uh, to defeat uh, in the 21st century. How can we understand uh, these uh, weaknesses of the, the West and, of course, uh, bring a, a more practical ideology that will uh, uh, counteract uh, this? Unfortunately, there is no leadership in Kiev. Uh, the leadership uh, that is actually governing Ukraine is outside of Kiev. So. Uh, if there was some leadership uh, in April last year, we would have had a peace uh, agreement already signed, probably, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. Because it's very clear when you just do the math, it's very much clear what is, um, you know, uh, uh, what are the chances 
Ukraine is right now, um, just like Dmitry mentioned in his speech, uh, it's living on uh, continuous aid and life support. And it's a systematic issue that cannot be fixed from within, right? So uh, unfortunately, that is also valid for many countries globally that um, have a GDP and, you know, the, uh, let's say, structure of economy that is just not sustainable as it is. So uh, unless uh, there is a reset of the um, um, economic system, that would be more um, linked to the actual resources that a country has. For instance, you know, the real value. Um, we will not see any changes because at the moment, when you look at the global debt and global GDP, those are the difference has reached, if I'm not mistaken, around 10 times. So there is no way that uh, the countries could ever pay off the debt, right? Sure. So the reset is needed. Normally, uh, throughout the human history, wars uh, were uh, playing that role of resetting, uh, resetting the um, uh, the economic system and resetting the balance of powers. So unless that happens, we will not see any positive developments. And uh, going back to the issues related to the Kiev regime, um, again, you know, there is no leadership uh, at the moment. It's just uh, quite a fake clown ship that we see happening. And the further it goes, the more obvious um, it becomes. So when you have a figure that is not autonomous, that is not sovereign at all, um, making you know key decisions in the country, the only hope you might possibly have in terms of that is that people regain their power because the actual original source of power in any country, according you know to most of the uh, constitutions and most of the uh, <laughs> let's say written sources, is uh, the people. So when you have a situation when uh, the people allow or even take part in the process of legitimizing such a regime, then you have an issue that cannot be fixed even from within. So unless there is a restart, unfortunately, there is no uh, positive forecast for that. Uh, talking about uh, the will of uh, the uh, people, and uh, I quite remember uh, during uh, one of our discussions, uh, you uh, were very uh, uh, critical uh, about the collective uh, West uh, that has actually uh, invaded uh, Ukraine and, of course, uh, uh, bringing more uh, uh, difficulty of uh, m making the situation more uh, problematic. So it brings uh, me back to the question of uh, sovereignty. So when we talk uh, or take a critical look at uh, the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, uh, we begin to question the role or uh, the place of sovereignty as far as uh, the uh, leadership of uh, Ukraine is uh, concerned. So how is uh, Ukraine's uh, sovereignty trapped by this uh, Western interference in uh, the uh, conflict in the Donbass? Yeah, Yulia? Well, when you talk about sovereignty, um, yes, when you talk about sovereignty, sovereignty is about uh, the ability and the uh, the will and the power to make own decisions, to be uh, autonomous in decision making, to rely on own uh, resources. And of course, in many cases, uh, this kind of power is being uh, delegated to somebody else just so that uh, they take care of the uh, issues. So this is how the sovereignty is given up um, in many cases just because, uh, you know, having it or owning it would imply a lot of responsibility and it would imply a lot of uh, additional risks. So Ukraine, um, when you look at it uh, historically, especially at, uh, you know, well, if, if it depends on what exactly you call Ukraine because there were quite a lot of uh, territorial changes in terms of that. But uh, as it is right now, it was never much sovereign, right? So the formal independence it got in the 90s, uh, it still implied quite a lot of dependence on Russian uh, resources. And this is something inevitable because there was no such a separate entity in terms of infrastructure even, right? I mean, energy infrastructure and the way everything was designed 
in the times of the Soviet Union, when the factories, when the uh, production lines, uh, mining activities, they were all interconnected. So you couldn't just separate it as uh, you cannot just cut your hand out and uh, say that you can be still functional as, uh, as a body, right? So it's quite a similar issue and, uh, you know, just like you cannot call a hand sovereign from the rest of the body, you couldn't call Ukraine sovereign. And uh, um, when we look at, uh, into those definitions, it's just, you know, a natural, uh, a natural political process. And I would add <laughs> something that might sound a bit provocative, but the, uh, the entire, uh, in my understanding, and that's my personal opinion, but the entire issue of nation states defined by fixed borders is something that always implies um, those slow bombs being, you know, buried under those borders, because it's very hard uh, to look at the historical context and say, you know, how, um, you know, where exactly this or that particular piece of land belongs to, especially if you had a lot of wars and that, you know, that piece of land is soaked in blood of the ones uh, dying for it, right? So it's a very complicated issue, but, you know, again, politically, historically, as a, or in terms of uh, the economy, uh, Ukraine wasn't much sovereign before. It's not much sovereign at the moment. And in the global interconnected world, as we see it right now, it's very hard to find someone who would be completely sovereign. So Russia is going through a sovereignty test at the moment with all of the sanctions, with the necessity to redesign economic patterns, trade patterns, with the necessity to rely mostly on own resources or resources coming from uh, new partners. So this is a huge sovereignty test for the whole world that we see happening right now. Um, if we're able to uh, rely on our own selves as countries, as entities, as uh, you know, whatsoever else, and if we're able to build effective partnerships, equal respectful partnerships that would allow to redesign the international, well, economy, trade, and uh, overall system of geopolitical relations on a different basis. So sovereignty test uh, is all about, you know, a fair evaluation of what's out there, what's out there to bring to the table and how it can be, um, you know, traded with others, how it can be complementary to each other, um, and how it could be done without the necessity to kill each other, to get those resources kill either morally or physically. Thank you for that, uh, dear Yulia. Just to remind our televiewers that if you are just tuning in, this is uh, Views on the Continent on the Pan-African Television Africa Media. And we continue to analyze uh, the crisis working uh, Russia, Ukraine, and looking at how Ukraine's, or if uh, Ukraine's uh, pursuit uh, of Western, or for Western uh, agenda has hindered a diplomatic solution uh, with uh, the Russian uh, Federation. I will go back to you, Mitri. Uh, uh, of course, in uh, September uh, 2023, I had this, uh, a uh, unique opportunity to become the first uh, African journalist, of course, to visit uh, the uh, Donbass, the, the region in crisis, after the start of the, the uh, special military uh, operation. And I was actually uh, uh, deeply uh, impressed and overwhelmed by the stories uh, I heard uh, there from uh, local residents uh, that gave me this uh, un uh, unique opportunity actually to engage uh, directly uh, with uh, the uh, population of uh, uh, Donbass, uh, particularly Donetsk. Now, the, the, the result of the trip was a film uh, re released uh, by uh, the uh, uh, African media, the Pan-African television, of course, which has been uh, broadcast uh, on a TV station and also on a social uh, media handles. And of course, this was in collaboration with uh, a Globe as uh, expert uh, club. We see that, that the struggle uh, against uh, 
the uh, Western hegemony has begun even in African countries and uh, the struggle of the residents of Donbass for sovereignty, uh, different uh, battles of uh, the same war indeed. Uh, now uh, to you, uh, Dimitri, uh, do you think uh, it is possible to draw parallels between the uh, situations uh, on the African continent and uh, in Eastern Europe? If so, what are the uh, uh, similarities between these uh, historical events, especially in uh, present day society? This question is direct, uh, directed to you, uh, Dimitri. I think that uh, the parallels are quite obvious. And uh, what we see now uh, with, with the actions of current uh, Western countries is a true uh, face of neocolonialism, of this neocolonialist practice. So it's a new form. Uh, it's different from what it was uh, 50, 60 years ago, uh, 70 years ago in Africa or elsewhere. But the task is the same. The task is first and foremost to divide and rule, to weaken uh, the uh, countries that can uh, challenge or defy the Western agenda, that could uh, withstand uh, the colonialists uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Now, the uh, the hegemonists uh, in the face of the United States uh, in our today's world. Uh, so the times have changed, but the methods have remained the same. And these countries, they absolutely do not care about about Russia, about Ukraine, in the same way that they didn't care and they don't care about Africa, about Asia. So they care only as long as these countries uh, help them to become richer. Uh, they only care about education in these countries when they can uh, bring labor force from these countries to, uh, to the U.S. and European countries. They're not interested on building factories, schools, uh, hospitals there. They just want to exploit their natural resources. And in order to make it uh, happen, they also uh, mobilize uh, some countries against other countries, uh, some peoples against other peoples. All this divisive agenda, I think, is quite known by our African brothers and sisters. And it's, it's the main reason of the crisis that is happening uh, all over the African continent uh, for many, many years to, to go. And there is no end to this crisis exactly because the Western countries are not interested in stopping this crisis. They don't want any change there. And they are very, they are very uh, jealous when it comes to Russia or China, which, which offer uh, alternative uh, agenda for African countries that are based on independence, that are based on mutual respect, on uh, creating conditions for internal growth, uh, they are very jealous because this exposes their agenda and their agenda is absolutely different. They want to exploit, to exploit they want to steal money uh, and they don't need any stability in, uh, in, in the region. So uh, they are now trying to portray the uh, uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine as a conflict for the territory, as Russia being aggressive towards its neighbor. But can you imagine uh living in africa and knowing how many how many peoples are living in different countries uh, across the border can you imagine how acute the, this problem is and can you imagine how would uh how would the countries uh, the african countries react uh, if uh, their neighbors uh, oppressed uh, their compatriots the, the 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 people of the same tribe of the same of the same nation if they forbade them to speak their own language and to uh, to uh, uphold their own version of history. How many conflicts would, would have sparked, how many more conflicts would have sparked in Africa because of that? And at the same time, you will see that, uh, uh, you will say countries like, for example, uh, Belgium or Switzerland, it's okay in Belgium to speak French and to speak uh, Netherlands, Flemish. Nobody is saying that the, uh, the French speaking uh, Belgians are supposed to speak Flemish or, or English. This is okay. This is normal. In Switzerland, you can speak German, you can speak French, you can speak Italian, and uh, your rights will be protected. But when the uh, Russian speakers who uh, really uh, represent a majority of the population, when they try to 
uh, uphold their rights and say that they have the right to speak uh, their own native language and to have education in their language for their children, they are deprived of this right. Of this right. Now, there are ridiculous things coming from Ukraine, uh, ridiculous and even dangerous. Uh, yesterday, for example, the one of the speakers of uh, the uh, Ukrainian parliament, uh, the Zelensky regime, uh, he said that there is no such thing as Russian minority in in Ukraine. I could agree that there is no such thing as Russian minority because there is Russian majority in Ukraine. Absolutely. But he absolutely, he absolutely denies any rights to these people. He says that uh, they are they have no right to speak their own language. Can you imagine how it is being viewed in Russia and in these regions of Ukraine as such? And I think that in Africa, all these problems uh, should be really uh, processed with the heart and with the mind and uh, so they should be extrapolated at, at your own experience with the colonizers and in the way they are treating your countries and in the way uh, they were and are still trying to uh, to to stall the future of your countries and to store to stall the possibilities for independent development so absolutely in the same way they are trying to to behave uh, against Russia with the only difference that with Russia it will not it, it will not uh, happen and it will there is no such a scenario uh, they only want to weaken our country uh, because they see uh, in our country uh, a very dangerous challenger of uh, of Ukrainian uh, of American hegemony in the world, and that's the only the only reason why they started all these all these things. And of course, uh, the latest development around the global world can already uh, show uh, the uh, complexity of uh, the uh, uh, involvement of the West and other NATO nations. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, we see uh, how Israel's uh, military actions against uh, uh, Palestine uh, uh, revealed the double standards of, of the West and shifted uh, the, the focus of attention of uh, the uh, mainstream uh, media. In uh, this uh, situation, Ukraine does not receive uh, the uh, attention and unlimited financial support uh, that it was already used to. Has uh, Ukraine's uh, desire to follow the Western agenda prevented the uh, possibility of finding diplomatic solutions with uh, Russia. Of course, here uh, we're answering uh, the question which holds uh, problematic uh, this day. Uh, uh, I will appreciate if you uh, answer to this question, uh, uh, Dimitri. Yes, indeed. Uh, the uh, situation in Gaza has opened an eyes of uh, a lot of uh, our uh, colleagues uh, on what was happening in Ukraine as well, because there are blatant they have double standards uh, in the approaches of um, of the West uh, towards the Ukrainian situation and in what's now happening in in Gaza. Um, there was a new there was a piece of news, I think several uh, several days ago, from Israel that. Uh, almost 4,000 refugees from from Israel decided to return to Ukraine because they say that it is much safer in Ukraine than in Israel right now. And this absolutely contradicts the whole uh, line of Western propaganda uh, which tried to present actions of Russia in Ukraine as targeted against civilians, despite the fact that we repeatedly uh, warned that we are not targeting uh, civilian objects and that uh, the damage that is being caused to civilian damage uh, to civilian uh, objects is mostly the result of the uh, faulty work of Ukrainian air defense which is being placed in the residential areas uh, in total breach of international humanitarian law so uh, it turns out to be that the Ukrainian cities uh, after after almost uh, two years of our special military operation continue to leave uh, more or less uh, normal life. If you browse internet, you will see uh, pictures of nightlife in Kiev, in Odessa, in Kharkov. Uh, on the other fact, on the other hand, you will you, you may look at the pictures of Gaza. And you will see what kind of devastation is is being caused if uh, the uh, can, if a country is uh, indiscriminately shelling residential areas and uh, residential zones uh, as we were as we were uh, accused of doing so uh, in Ukraine, absolutely wrongly uh, and baselessly accused. 
what's happening in Gaza resembles rather the U.S. tactics in, in Mosul or in Raqqa, uh, which we all remember when the city is almost erased from the surface on the earth. But at the same time, the um, uh, fallout of this, uh, the reaction of this, uh, to this from Western media and from Western politicians is very, is very mild, is very modest. So uh, it, it's absolutely clear that uh, the West is uh, analyzing the situation in Ukraine and situation in, uh, uh, in Gaza through the optics of uh, who is the friend uh, and who is the foe of the West. So if Russia is the foe, of the West, then of course it can't be a good country, it can't behave in a good way, whatever it does. Uh, there is a lot of Western propaganda trying to attribute to us things that we never did. In the, on the other hand, if Israel is uh, being presented as the only democracy in the Middle East, it's not my quote, but it's the quote of some American politicians or and, and uh, European politicians, of course, it's not supposed to be criticized and its methods are not supposed to be criticized. And we see how the West is implementing these blatant uh, double standards. And I think that uh, the West has lost, lost a lot of credibility after the events uh, in Gaza uh, started. Uh, and a lot of people saw their uh, clear parallel uh, with the Ukrainian situation, in the, with the way Russia is being uh, treated and accused uh, by the West. Thank you so much. We continue with you, uh, dear Yulia. We are conversant of the fact that uh, uh, Zelensky uh, came to power in Ukraine with a promise of uh, bringing uh, peace and, of course, bringing the lost uh, uh, glories of uh, the uh, country. And uh, today we see that uh, that is not actually happening as uh, the, uh, uh, the country is still in a crisis with a lot of uncertainty. So we want to see how uh, the this Western agenda pursued by Ukraine has entangled its own uh, domestic uh, foreign policy and even uh, uh, domestic policy and even uh, foreign policy. And of course, what are the, the present stakes and what can be done? Well, the future is at stake. Uh, just to put it short, the future is at stake, and uh, as one of the uh, famous uh, quotation goes, the future belongs to the ones, I will rephrase a little bit, that work on reshaping it, because if you just uh, try to, you know, sail along the, uh, uh, you know, the waters, um, as it's uh, being said, you know, only that fish uh, <laughs> flows along the river. So, uh, um, there is, um, uh, there is, um, I would say, everything at stake and uh, the future in the first place, and that's what uh, actually the, uh, the the current confrontation is all about. So it's much more than uh, uh, than some of the uh, battles taking place here and there um, all over the world. Basically, it's more about the uh, uh, power to design the uh, future and the willpower to even dare to do so because uh, basically we have two completely different paradigms and while we're all distracted by the wars and by other um well let's say events and other crises that target the very core of uh, our uh, moral and psychological stability, you know, the issues related to sur survival while we're trying to survive. What is actually at stake is uh, how the world would look like in 5, 10, 30 years from now, because parallel to what we are distracted by on the news, on the media, we see that the technological progress, the uh, AI artificial intelligence, the um, um, robotic technologies, uh, and many other things have reached uh, an extent at which quite soon we might be actually facing what we've seen, uh, what we've seen in some of the uh, fiction movies, right? So this is, I suppose, where the focus of attention should lie in, right? Uh, what uh, the post-transformational world uh, 
uh, what it would be looking like. And that's uh, that kind of thinking is exactly what led me to the idea of the uh, Globus uh, International Expert Club that was founded one and a half years ago. Um, uh, you know, discussions built around attractive agenda that could be uh, balancing up uh, or maybe even gaining more weight than the destructive uh, agenda promoted by the West. So that is all about killing the very spirit uh, of the people, suppressing the soul, uh, possessing the mind, uh, the thinking process, and all of its, uh, with all of those distractions, with all of the, uh, uh, I would say, satanic um, um, goals. Put it. So that's what the confrontation is all about. We can take it down to the level of uh, possible economic implications. We can take it down to the level of geopolitical consequences. But if we look at the broader uh, picture, uh, it's about the uh, you know the resources, uh, material and non-material resources. It's all about uh, you know the energy generated by. Uh, vivid and vibrant human beings and uh, it's all about the future that's what's at stake i stay with you uh, dear yulia you know some critics uh, say uh, that uh, russia is trying to counteract the west but then uh, it's uh, bringing forth or preparing an ideology which will be even uh, worse by by the west uh, uh, worse than that of the west uh, how can you react to this uh, because uh, when you listen to, to what people have to say uh, regarding the leadership of russia they're like critics Russia or Vladimir Putin has already designed an ideology that will be worse than that of the West. How can you analyze this in relation to the uh, ongoing uh, uh, crisis between uh, uh, Ukraine and uh, Russia? Well, you know, uh, in in these terms, I would say that uh, it's good then that Russia doesn't have an ideology that it's trying to promote at the moment. So there have been many discussions uh, regarding this during the past couple of decades. And uh, it's not just about the legalistic approach according to which and according to the Russian constitution as well, Russia doesn't and cannot have a state-level ideology. But when you talk about the, um, uh, let's say, the um, some of the uh, key points that are being promoted, of course, there is the uh, desire from the Russian side that is being expressed at different levels and at the highest political level by the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, that... Uh, there is a lot uh, that needs to be deconstructed, right, uh, in terms of the current uh, economic and political um, global systems. And there are uh, some of the institutions that need to be fixed and brought back to what they were actually designed for. Uh, but when you talk about the Russian, uh, let's say, agenda, it's not much about ideology, but it's more about the spirit, right? And that spirit, um, is something that is hard to verbalize, I would assume. Uh, well, at least a lot of thinkers here in the country and, you know, philosophers and uh, a lot of just experts and people with humanitarian minds, they were trying to describe it, but it's really hard to catch it in, uh, in a specific phrase. So... Um, I suppose that uh, in in these terms, it's a good thing because otherwise it would be exactly what you're saying, you know, just replacing one suppressive system by another. So uh, the fact that there is no ideology being promoted, I think, is a good one because it's, it allows and it creates more space for... Uh, development and it creates more space for a sovereign development when different actors are free to be themselves if they wish to do so. Well, at least in, in the optimistic perspective, that's what it would look like. But, um, you know, there are always uh, different kinds of risks as, uh, you know, we know that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So either there is balance or there is hegemony and 
you know, whoever gets the absolute power is doomed to be corrupt. So there has to be a certain system of uh, checks and balances. And I think that the global community is designed that way, that, you know, one part of the world has one kind of strengths and resources that it can bring to the table. Another part of the world has something else to offer. So if you look at it like this, there is less space for competition and there is more space for cooperation. But only if uh, you have that very uh, thinking in your mind when you when you uh, look at the opportunities that we have on you know this planet. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, dear Yulia. And uh, coming back to your statement, which said uh, that the stake is uh, the future, I will appreciate if uh, Mitria Polinsky will answer to this question now, taking into account uh, the, uh, the conflict that are erupting in the different uh, regions uh, from uh, Eastern Europe to Africa. How do you think uh, the geopolitical transformation will develop and what would the world be like, uh, let's say, in uh, five years' time? Question directed to Dmitry Polyansky. What, how do you think uh, the world will be in uh, the next five years? Well, it's very difficult to predict these kind of things. Uh, and uh, one, thing, one thing is for sure that the world has changed and the world will never be the same as it was uh, before uh, the uh, beginning of this uh, hot stage uh, of Ukrainian crisis and also before the uh, Israel's actions in Gaza. Uh, the world has changed and we are now only, shape, only seeing the shape of this world, uh, what we uh, know for sure in Russia, that the so-called uh, Pax Americana is definitely over. So nobody is willing to succumb to the uh, pressure of the U.S., to its uh, hegemony, and nobody has, has asked the U.S. and its ally allies to play the role of world policemen, uh, what they are doing uh, everywhere in the world. So uh, it's quite clear that militarily uh, the position, the situation of the Kiev regime uh, is uh, is far from being perfect. Uh, they are uh, out of manpower. They are very much doubtful in terms of receiving uh, more significant Western uh, military assistance. And without Western military assistance, they're absolutely incapable of fight fighting of their own. It's not a revelation that Zelensky has squandered already several armies in terms of military equipment and he's now only surviving like a drug addict only at the uh, with the help of, of Western uh, assistance and Western aid. So uh, the changes are looming and the uh, the horizon for the end of uh, hostilities in Ukraine is also looming. I don't know, I'm not a prophet to predict uh, how and when it will end, but I'm absolutely sure that all the aims of our special military operation uh, will be achieved. Uh, what we don't want, we don't we, we, we don't want to have a hornet's nest uh, on our borders, uh, a neo-Nazi formation, a nationalist formation, provoking Russia and uh, abusing uh, Russian speakers. I think that not a single country would tolerate this. Uh, Russia is not an, an exception. So we will be uh, very much favorable to uh, finding a fair uh, solution, fair peace in Ukraine, which would be based on the implementation of these uh, goals of our special military operations. So we never uh, withdrew from negotiating table. It's not us who uh, who, are do who is doing so. It's, it's enough to mention that Zelensky himself uh, forbade himself to be uh, part of negotiation problems when last year he introduced a bill uh, which uh, is uh, uh, forbidding him to enter negotiations with Russian government. So I, I can't understand uh, how it will be possible for, for him theoretically to start negotiations if this bill is in force. There are a lot of things that we also do not tolerate in, in Ukraine. Uh, we can't uh, accept the prosecution of uh, canonical orthodoxy in Ukraine, which is what is being done is absolutely heinous and criminal. 
and we are also attracting attention uh, to this because there is a political project in Ukraine that is being imposed on its population. The population does not buy it, but still Zelensky regime tries to uh, to get rid of the uh, of the canonical Orthodox Church, uh, which was present at these lands uh, for hundreds of years and uh, which is being supported by the majority of its population. This is also criminal. And at the same time, I can reassure you that uh, regardless what you might read in, in the Western media uh, or would West, what Western politicians would tell you, uh, we still remain very close uh, countries, Ukraine and Russia. Our peoples remain very close. It's enough to say that there are several millions, I think five millions of Ukrainians who found refuge in Russia after the beginning of the hostilities. And it, it makes Russia the biggest uh, country for those who fled uh, Ukrainian crisis. It, it means that Ukrainians are safe in, in Russia. Ukrainians are not afraid. Nobody is infringing on their rights uh, in Russia. And it all, totally contradicts the narrative that is being promoted uh, by the West, that Russians hate Ukrainians, that Russians want to kill Ukrainians, that Russians want Ukrainian lands. No, it's not about land. This conflict is absolutely not about land. We have enough of land in Russia. Absolutely. It's a question of human rights, it's a question of dignity, and it's a question of making an end to the Western interference uh, into, into our country's affairs, into the affairs of our neighbors, and to stop this policy of, uh, of uh, setting up flames around our borders, of uh, regime changes, and all these things for which the West is so famous and so notorious. So, th so this is all about it. And I think that uh, the victory is, is, is looming. It's inevitable, whatever the Western uh, politicians uh, would uh, claim and do. Uh, as for the Middle East, it's very difficult to predict because this is unfortunately only initial stage of this crisis. And um, we will try and we are doing uh, the, the most possible things uh, as much as we can to stop this fighting, to save the people of, of Gaza, to save Palestinians, and to come back to the um, situation uh, when the Security Council uh, decisions uh, on the independent Palestine living with uh, in peace and harmony with Israel would be implemented. We are unfortunately quite far from this, and, and we are quite far also because of what the West is doing, what the United States is doing, because they are absolutely no inter not interested in uh, such a scenario they are interested in upholding the position of israel and they want to do everything uh, for israel to continue its military operation in gaza uh, to find a solution that would be favorable to israel and this is of course not fair and i think that the majority of uh, of peoples in the world uh, understand this quite clearly and russia is uh, with all these people to promote the uh, fair case of palestinian people Indeed, uh, I think uh, with uh, the realities uh, on the ground, uh, we can, all the world can uh, better know that there is already a paradigm shift uh, in uh, the geopolitical uh, maneuver and, of course, the perspectives uh, are coming as regards uh, the uh, political uh, upheavals uh, pertaining uh, uh, the global world. I want to appreciate you, uh, uh, Dmitry Polyansky, who is uh, Russia's first deputy uh, uh, permanent representative uh, at the United Nations. I appreciate you, and it was nice having you on uh, African Media Television. Thank you for your insight on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the viewers. And I'm absolutely sure that Africa will have a bright future together with Russia as one of the polars of the multipolar world, which is being born right now. And I think that uh, we can always count on Russia uh, in defending the uh, African interests. Uh, and uh, we are doing this in the United Nations and where we will be doing this elsewhere uh, with your help and with your support. Thank you very much. You're most uh, welcome. Uh, coming back to you, uh, dear Yulia, one last uh, word uh, before we uh, uh, conclude for today. Um, I would like to thank you and Mr. Polanski for this uh, very important discussion. I think it went uh, above and beyond the uh, uh, 
uh, topic originally uh, mentioned uh, for today's program. So um, I would just like to uh, say that uh, I appreciate the uh, the hard tasks that uh, you have at Afrique Media and uh, I hope that uh, this uh, conversation was uh, of interest for uh, the ones watching as well. Thank you. Thank you. It was indeed uh, interesting and of course uh, it will go a long way to change our perspectives uh, uh, surrounding especially uh, international cooperation or global cooperation in uh, the 21st century. It's always a pleasure having you to share this uh, uh, thought-provoking uh, insight uh, on issues of global interest. Thank you so much and I appreciate uh, you televiewers for always trusting the Pan-African Television. Remember that uh, information is uh, knowledge. Uh, we can't go without acknowledging the technicians for ensuring uh, that uh, the program was a success in spite of uh, the uh, technical hurdles. I want to appreciate you. Do have a lovely time uh, as you keep watching program on Afric Media. Bye-bye. <laughs>